more thing. I had a conversation a few months ago with a woman who was, uh, who was interested in uh, homeschooling her children and she has daughters. And uh, I was speaking to her about her education plan, what she's teaching. She says her husband's strengths are such and such, her strengths are such and such. I said, what about, what about Torah? This is a religious family, purportedly. And uh, learning about Judaism is important for every Jew. So how are you teaching that to your, to your daughters? And she said, oh, well, why is it important for my daughters to know about Judaism? I said, you want them to be religious? Said, yeah, I want them to be religious. I'm religious. I don't know very much. That's, 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 that might have worked for you in your generation. But in the generation that we're in now, I felt a little bit like Sarah Shanir, from the, the beginner of the Beit Yaakov movement uh, that we learned about last year. And uh, it, it's it, some things that are okay for some generations don't work for, for the next generation. And this generation, this next coming generation of, of especially uh, young girls are inculcated, are in, inundated with all kinds of different influences at home, on the screen, from YouTube and from their friends, from, the, from school all kinds of different ideas and to know if they're Jewish ideas and how, can, how they can be, if, the, if they are consistent with Torah, what Hashem wants from us. These are all things, these are all questions that are going to be difficult to answer unless we actually study Torah. And so these girls and all girls should be able to study Torah. And that's an important thing. And each parent has to find a, a, a way that makes Torah uh, important and relevant to every child so that the, the Torah can continue uh, amongst that family. Otherwise, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker of, uh, of the night. Uh, for it's, it's even later at night for her. She's uh, all the way in Massachusetts. And uh, to uh, let's, let's hear from uh, Sarah Piha. Okay, so this is Melinda Zayman. She's a fine jewelry designer. She's a mother and she's a convert because modern converts are kind of my thing in these presentations. Um, the neat thing about her is she's, she's alive, she's here now, and it's showing that the modern Jewish woman um, can go on and do so many, so many different things, so many different avenues. Um, I messaged her on Instagram and she never saw it, but she's here. So that's kind of cool. Um, she's all over different parts of media in both United States and Japan. She's a fine jewelry designer. And to find young women who are jewelry designers is already a pretty monumental feat and then to be Jewish on top of it is even a whole nother layer to it which is really special uh, she's very active on her social media so you'll see everything from her jewelry to things she just finds beautiful in life and her, her family or children or pets so very seems very down to earth and just normal um, the very crazy thing about her is she's incredibly diverse so if you see her I don't know if you can see my mouse but this is her right here the one all the way to the right and she's not only Jewish, but she's mixed race. So her dad's from Ghana. Um, he moved to England as a banker. Um, her mom's from Hong Kong and moved to England for accounting. Uh, they met in England and then they got divorced and the mom took her back to Hong Kong. So now she's growing up in Hong Kong and her um, she looks so different than everybody else in Hong Kong. She's in an area called the Midlands, which is kind of like a middle class, it seemed like, to lower class area. And she looks different than everybody else so she really doesn't identify with the Hong Kong culture with the Cantonese culture she has to pick up and learn Cantonese really quick um, and she's kind of like an oddball there she's appreciative of the culture she enjoys everything but at the same time she's influenced by what she sees on MTV apparently MTV was really big in Hong Kong and the Jennifer Lopez and cowboy hats and she just kind of dressed crazy because she was trying to express herself but wasn't quite sure how so then it's time to go to college and she decides to go to UC, uh, US, or USD, uh, UCSD. Um, she goes to school in LA and then she decides it's too slow paced over there. And she comes back to, um, she goes back to Hong Kong and ultimately meets her husband there. Uh, it's kind of neat when she went to school in LA, she was, um, she didn't really have a way to get in. It's a, it was a hard school to get into, and the only area that would allow her to move into the dorm that had a spot was the special, the special district, and that was for relig religion. So ironically, the Jews are on that floor, and the Muslims are on the floor, and they put her on the Muslim floor um, on that side because 
you know, she just needed to check a box to try to get in there. She wasn't remotely Muslim, but she wanted to get into the school. So she checked whatever box she had to. And she became friends with some of the Muslim kids. But at the same time, the Jewish kids were the ones who were inviting her to Shabbat dinners. And she really, she'd walk past the little bridge that there's literally a bridge that separated one side to the other um, and walk over to the Jewish side all the time. And it was really kind of sparked something within her. Um, so she ends up converting. Um, after she first, she goes all the way to Hong, back to Kong, Hong Kong. She meets an American man or a a European American man and they fall in love and he's not really a practicing Jew whatsoever like he doesn't really do any Jewish stuff but she's learning about it and she's already had a spark within her in college and she's like wait a second if I have an opportunity to raise my future children Jewish and have a Jewish home I'm not missing out on that and she's working and she's proposed to and he's not very religious and she said you know what I'm going to convert because I want to have I want to be more religious so she ultimately takes her husband and makes him more religious um, she goes all the way to Svat and learns there. And then after Svat, she had to go back to Hong Kong. And then her bet din was all the way in Sydney, Australia. So here I am complaining that I have to go to had to go up to LA all the time for my conversion. And I realized in other countries, you literally have to go a long flight and all sorts of trips to convert. So I guess my going back to LA and for, back and forth to LA in traffic um, it's slightly comparable to that because LA traffic's the worst, but you know what? That takes a lot. So to fly all the way over and ultimately I had the Bet Dean pastor. It looked like it was on the first try, which is amazing. Um, and she converted. And I think you'll find with any convert is we are a very defensive group. As so soon as someone says, Oh, you converted, you you look at she added this in her interview. It was me who decided to convert because everyone assumes you meet a Jewish guy and then you just convert for him. So you get really defensive of that off the bat. And this is her husband, Jonathan Zaman. Um, it helps that he's absolutely loaded. Her father is on the board of the Wynn Hotels. He made millions and billions by selling clothes to China, or sorry, selling clothes to Hong Kong through China and um, to Canada, all sorts of things. So he made a killing. Um, he wasn't, the son was not a very religious guy, but became more religious over time. And now they raise their family com completely Orthodox, uh, which is really special. And something I found really interesting in a lot of these articles, it's showing, you know, either the jewelry side of things or the Jewish side of things, but there's not really much like overlapping. And there was one really interesting article that I found that she said part of the reason that Judaism really, really stuck to her so quickly is that she never found an identity, uh, like the way she looked, the way she felt, the way that she felt in college when she was around the Jewish culture. She loves tradition and Cantonese culture. Tradition is probably the biggest aspect of it. Uh, I guess during the uh, new year, there's an entire week where you're supposed to go in and visit extended relatives. And she's like, I always thought that was great. But when you're Jewish, you get every Friday night to go visit relatives. You have no excuse. So aspects like Shabbat, and she said things like eating kosher and having rules and structure. So the structure ultimately changed her entire life, whether it's her culture, whether it's how she lives every day, um, her business, everything. Um, and as someone who converted, I can definitely agree with that to go from really no structure. Everyone always assumes that um, a lot of people say, oh, you know, you want to be converted, you know, being Jewish is really hard. And I was talking to my brother in law, Rabbi, he's never really known much else. And I was explaining to him when you don't have a guide, it's really hard. You mess up a lot and obviously not huge ways, but just, you know, Judaism tells you how to eat. It tells you how to follow the rules. It tells you how, which way to put your shoes on first. Um, to have that guide really eliminates a lot of trial and error, which helps with time, which helps with how you feel. Um, it's just it's so nice to have that structure. Uh, her business, it's kind of neat. She's like, a, her business is super colorful, super super wild and out there. She says, life's too short to wear boring jewelry. And her Bouchier uh, line is all sorts of crazy types of jewelry. And I'll end this by sharing this part. Um, this is just what her jewelry looks like. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's not, doesn't really look like Jewish jewelry. Does that look like Jello? Yeah, so she's got like a lot of, I don't know why it's not I'm loading. sorry, I just thought of Jello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so the bottom part I wish it would load is literally like she's like wiggle jelly jiggling jello in her jewelry so she makes it really playful and really fun um it doesn't look very standard she wanted it to be really modern really new um honestly I wish there was a little bit more Jewish influence in her jewelry like if she had you know there's so many ways that she could do things honoring Judaism um and I didn't see too much of that and honestly I was a little bit disappointed I expected that kind of in there 
Um, but again, it's fun. It's beautiful, fun, but still really interesting what she's doing in the jewelry world. And I love hearing the stories of other converts because everyone has a crazy conversion story on how they ended up there. Um, so all in all, that is Melinda Zaman. Thank you for sharing, Sarah. Um, love the jewelry brand. It's always good to know and support Jewish businesses. I see next on the list is Flora Sassoon. So Sandra, if you'd like to go. So Flora Sassoon is the woman that I chose. She's much more traditional um, than Sarah's uh, uh, woman. <laughs> I can't remember her name. Flora Sassoon. But, um, she was, I thought what I would do is ask you um, three questions that were most interesting to me. Um, and then when you hear it, you might want to think about it. And then I'll go back to it and ask you what you think. The first question is, why do you think that Flora Sassoon traveled with a minion of 10 men? That was the first question. Question number two, why do you think Flora Sassoon was permitted to read from the Torah when she was in Baghdad? A very, very orthodox woman. And the third question is, in your opinion, is there any justification for orthodox women not to learn Gemara? We talked a little bit about that on Shabbat. So those of you who are there on Shabbat already have some answers <laughs> that I didn't know. Okay, so Flora Sassoon was born in 1859. That's approximately about the same time as the Civil War was raging here in the United States. She was born in Bombay, India. Her father was born in Baghdad, Iraq, but later came to India. Her maternal great-grandfather, his name was David Sassoon, and he was born in the late 1700s. He was a leading trader of cotton and, more importantly, opium, and the treasurer of Baghdad. So while I was talking to my former sister-in-law, who lives in London, uh, she told me that she knew very she knew about this family because her own mother was also born in India, but her parents were born in Iraq, and she knew that opium opium in the 1800s was a very healthy and needed drug. It was used only for medicinal purposes. Uh, Interesting, Florida attended Catholic school. She was also tutored privately by rabbis from Baghdad. She married at the age of 14. By the age of 17, she spoke six languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Hindustani, Hindustani, English, French, and German. She was already considered one of the world's most learned women by the time she was 17. She was an observant Jew who always traveled with a minyan of 10 men. So that's what I would like to ask you to think about. Why would she travel with a minyan of 10 men? And with her own personal shochet. But it was her Jewish scholarship that was unique. She became an expert on Sephardi doctrine and practice. She wrote an article on Rashi showing remarkable expertise on his commentaries. She discussed punctuation in the Masora text. She knew details of all the female members of Rashi's family and quotes many of his responsa where he appears to defend the rights of women. She wrote a text for the Jewish forum and discussed the significance of the number 13 in Jewish sources. When she went to Baghdad for three months, and here is the next question. She read from the Torah in her family synagogue using the scroll dedicated by the Baghdad patriarch of the Sassoon family. Flora Sassoon was also a businesswoman. 
Her family was known as the Rothschilds of the East. She took over her husband's trading business in India when he died. Later, she was a strong supporter of the, of the Balfour Declaration and a staunch Zionist. While she was living in India, she was a supporter of the vaccine against cholera and encouraged Hindus and Muslims to take it. After moving to England, she donated to Jews around the world who wrote to her with requests for money. They addressed the letters, Flora Sassoon, England. And everyone knew exactly where to send it to, send it to. Just she just needed, they just needed her name and the country. She held an open house once a week, and her banquets were legendary. According to the historian Cecil Roth, quote, and I quote, she walked like a queen, talked like a sage, and entertained like an oriental. And this one I don't know, but I'm copying it. Potentat. Potent, potentat, anyway, a very, very special woman. Flora Sassoon died in England in 1936 at the age of 76. She was buried on Mount of Olive Cemetery in Jerusalem. So I am next. And thank you, Sandra and Sarah, for your wonderful presentations. Um, I will be speaking about Ruth Ben David. Oh, hi. And she is a rather mysterious and controversial figure in modern Jewish history. She's a Parisian Sorbonne educated Garas. She was a French double agent in World War II. She actually served time in Moroccan jails and was sought after by Mossad and Interpol. These things are all quite incredible things to do just in one lifetime. But as Ruth would go on to get older and experience all these things, she would actually go on to live her life as a Haredi woman who would leave a lasting impact on the modern state of Israel by mixing with the anarchist Haredi factions and committing Israel's most publicized crimes of the 1960s, kidnapping Yose, Yosele Schumacher. So we start off when, as she was born, she was born Madeline Perel, um, an only child to a dysfunctional Catholic French family. She actually grew up in central Paris next to the Luxembourg Gardens, which housed one of Paris's most famous churches. And this, along with her Catholic schooling, um, piqued her interest in religion. And through, through her life, as she would go through her, her trials and tribulations, she would often come back to religion, um, finding different ones, seeing what worked for her, what called to her, um, and find, finding her truth. So at 19, she left home for the south of France, where she would meet her first husband and had her son, Claude. And after two years of marriage, Madeline and her first husband divorced. She left her son with her mother and joined the French guerrilla fighters in 1944. Under the French resistance command, Ruth joined the Gestapo as a double agent. One of the many incredible stories from this time of her life that shows her courageousness is this one. So Ruth traveled by train into Nazi Germany, carrying forged documents. She went into a concentration camp with her head held high. She went to the head officers and announced that there had been a mistake. And she swiftly pulled one Jewish woman out of the camp, saving her life. And they went back on the train together to France. Ruth carried out this operation completely independently, knowing that the repercussions could have cost her her life. And she did these heroic acts with a young son at home in between being a double agent, a teacher, a dancer at a Parisian bar actually to make ends meet, but she was also a mother. And after the war, Madeleine, as she was still known, was tortured for being a Gestapo agent. This left severe traumatic repercussions on a still young woman, not even 25 years old, had she done all of this. 
Ruth described this time in her life where she wouldn't eat or get out of bed. Finally, she enrolled at the Sorbonne for her PhD, motivated by education, studying philosophy and religion. It was at that school that she met an Israeli man, a professor of French literature at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And the two became interested in one another and became seeing one another. And so Madeline looked into converting into Judaism. Ultimately, their match did not work, but the French professor brought her to Israel, exposing her and her son to Yiddishkeit. So in 1952, Madeline went, underwent a halakhic conversion with her son, who she renamed Oriel, and she renamed herself as Ruth Ben David. Here they are after their conversion. So in Israel, Ruth and Uriel at the time um, were big Zionists and they joined their local chapter and they even competed in a competition with the Jewish National Fund that had launched a campaign to purchase trees to plant in Israel. And whoever sold the largest number of trees would win a flight to the Holy Land. Her son was as determined as his mother and he sold the most trees, winning them a trip. So Ruth joined her son on that trip and it was life altering and that they decided to make Aliyah. And after they made Aliyah, they went to different yeshivas to enroll her son in. And eventually Ruth moved from a very Zionist approach to a Satmar Haredi one, befriending Rabbi Avraham Eliyahu Mezis of the anti-Zionist yeshiva Torah Vira. Now this is where the story gets kind of interesting. You see, Israel in the 1960s was characterized by large infrastructure projects, such as the development of orange packing industries, their economy was booming, the inauguration of the Hadassah Hospital, they had large infrastructure projects being built. For example, Israel's first, a nuclear reactor, which is pictured above right here, and a functioning justice system. For example, we had the Eichmann capture, Morocco legalized immigration to Israel, um, Jerusalem was reunited in 1967. These were all things for cause for major celebration. However, internally, the country was having an ideological battle with one another. You see, during the pre-independence era and through the 1950s, Israeli culture was dominated by the spirit and traditions of the Palmach underground of patriotism, nation building, heroism, and shared struggle. It was an egalitarian and informal spirit. But by the end of the 1950s, a new wave appeared, a wave of poets and songwriters, authors and critics. And they thought the old generation was too collectivist, too nationalistic. And these young artists were influenced by the new wave that was spreading through the Europe and the West. So the socialists and the new hippies alike had little patience for their fellow Haredi citizens. More so, citizens were seized with the idea of, you know, the, the kibbutz dogma of uh, children not living with their parents, but in separate children's homes, seeing their parents for maybe an hour a day so that the adults could go out and build the country. And these ideas were also hot and charged around. The passions were high and real people in the process got hurt. And that is what brings us to back to Ruth. You see, in these years, there was suspicion and mistrust between the secular government and the religious population. Um, it was reported that the government was actually cutting off Yemenite children's payos and shipping the Moroccan immigrants off to secular kibbutzim, and this scared all of the religious um, citizens. And so we are taken to the story of Yosele. And in, in this story, which captivated the entire country, starts off with Yosele's grandfather, Nachman Starks, who was a Breslover Hasid, who survived Stalin's Siberian Gulag and remained committed to the Torah all throughout his hardships in the Soviet Union. Under his care, Yosele was receiving a religious education. But you see, Yosele's parents were struggling new immigrants who liked the nationalist ideas and many not Israel at the time. Fearful for his grandson's Hinuch, Nachman decided to abduct his own grandson in defiance of a court order. Nachman wanted to continue raising Yosele as an ultra-Orthodox Jew in light of the fact that his parents were no longer religious. 
and the press widely publicized the story and the Knesset debated its implications. The Israeli police avidly sought the eight-year-old boy and searched every Orthodox community in Israel for him. And this led to an early polarization among Israeli Jews due to disagreements between the religious and the secular. So how did Ruth get herself into all of this? Well, in the beginning, she was Zionist. However, within a few years, she became convinced that this philosophy was wrong and that the thesis of nationalism should replace the Torah as the basis of the Jewish people. So she completely swung across the pendulum and she condemned the Zionist movement. But you see, she was a learned woman. She had traveled the world. She worked as a devil spy. She knew multiple languages. And her in the Haredi community, she didn't blend in right away. She knew too much. She was too educated, especially in those times in that decade. And plus she was a single mother too. So with no employment prospects before her and with her son to support, she was dependent on her new religious community. And her mentor, who was in the Naturi Karta, an infamous anti-Zionist religious group, Avraham Eli Meziz, he was widely aware of both Ruth's skills, her knowledge, her international contacts, and her previous spy life. So when he was, became aware of the boy's dilemma, what seemed to be his dilemma of going back to his parents and going back to communist Russia and living an, a non-Torah lifestyle or versus staying with his father, this rabbi told Ruth about the, the predicament and he told her, he said that her knowledge was the only way to get Yosela out of Israel and save him. And Ruth listened. And this was the largest crime known in all of Israel in the 1960s, bringing the country almost to a civil war. And so at first the Israeli government sent police officers through Haredi communities looking for Yosele. And this slowly became a show of counterculture rebellion. Anyone who looked religious was accosted on the streets of the taunts of where is Yosele, where is Yosele, as we see here. David Ben-Gurion actually set Mossad's head had agent Isser Haral to task. He said, we're dropping every other case of national security and we're gonna solve this. And he received lots of criticism for this. They actually were on the hot pursuit of infamously known murderer, Dr. Joseph Mengel, who they had located in Brazil. But David Ben-Gurion said, we're not gonna look for him anymore. We're gonna find Yosele. And this divided Israeli society. So underground agents would be sent into Haredi communities, but they were unaccustomed to their customs and to their way of life. So Mossad actually found it easier to infiltrate Eichmann's Nazi circle in Argentina than it was to infiltrate Haredi communities. So how did Ruth get him out of the country? Well, she disguised Josele as a girl and remade her son's uh, passport. Her son's name used to be Claude, and she renamed Yosele as Claudine. They dyed his hair and they took him out. And anywhere that the, that the Mossad was looking for him, they left. She took him around from Switzerland and France and Belgium, enrolling him in yeshivas for six, seven months at a time. In 1961, the FBI agents actually searched ultra-Orthodox summer camps in the Catskill Mountains looking for him. And it was eventually where he was staying in Williamsburg, where he was... Um, recovered. The Mossad agents actually who captured Eichmann posed as real estate agents to meet Ruth, who had decided to sell her house in Paris. And though she was uncooperative at first and holding firm in her beliefs of what she did was right, she finally ad admitted her complicity and gave them the address to return the boy. Um, but there are crowds by the hundred waiting to see his return. And that, that's really the heart of this, that she, she came to Judaism excited and passionate. And what happened to her, she, she found herself in so many divisive situations 
For example, after, um, after Yosela and after her life calmed down a little bit, she was proposed a shidduch to the head of the anti-Zionist um, faction of Nuri Qatar, um, to the head of it, who is Abraham Blau, the head of Nuri Qatar, and she actually described it, seeing him as love at first sight. However, his children did not agree, and they went to the Haredi High Court and asked the court to stop the shidduch. And the court system in the Haredi world erupted trying to tear the shidduch apart. A Satmar leader intervened, offering her $25,000 if she would agree to waive Blau's commitment to marry her. Because, you know, Judaism, we have a legal system. It was a binding document. They, they signed their vort, and it was a promise to get married. So this happened, and Rabbi Blau was deposed as the leader and became a persecuted individual. People even spat at him on the streets. Once a most revered rabbi in all of Israel who'd never even left Jerusalem before. But to marry Ruth, he agreed he would leave the city and live in B'nai Brach, where actually the, the front door of his, his and her home, and they had the, the hinges torn off of the front door. And when researching this, I found a Times article that came out actually a day after they got married. And it says this quote on the slide, that in the Talmud, says one, it is written that a city can breathe only through its righteous man. Now that Amram has left Jerusalem, I cannot sleep at night, for the city is no longer safe. And while we know this faction group today is violent and they set things on fire and they throw stones, he was actually much more about peace from what I've researched about him. Sure, sure, he had his ideological problems with the state of Israel, but it never let him um, get in between his Ahabat Israel. And as we are coming into Shavuot, something that stood out to me through the whole time researching Ruth was that she had been in many different situations in her life where she was at the heart of Jews either disagreeing with one another or fighting with one another. And, and in Shavuot, we got the Torah because we were all united as one. And as we go into Shavuot, it was opening my, my own mind and my own horizons to read about a woman who I may not have necessarily ideologically agreed with. And learning about her has brought me closer to my Jewish sisters. And I'm so thankful to Rabbi Eddie for putting on this event where we can learn about brave Jewish women who may be different from us, but should be celebrated all the same. So thank you. Oh. And I wanted to mention that you can still register for the Shavuot dinner. So information is right here. If you would like help registering, you can reach out to Zavi or I. So thank you for listening. Okay, so, so I'm doing uh, Tamaral Bergsten. I hope I don't butcher her name. It's a uh, it's Polish for Tamar. There's the Polish version of Tamar. Okay. So we don't know so much about her earlier years, but she was born in Poland in 1765. Um, her father's name was Avraham. Um, and all we know about him is that he was a big Talmud Chacham and he was very well off. Um, so she married Jacob Jacobson when she was young and they had one child together. His name was Hirsch, um, but very short, shortly after um, they had Hirsch, he passed away. So in 1787, Tamaral met Dove Bear or Barrick, um, and he also came from a very well-off background. He was known to be, his father was known to be one of the first, was known to be one of the wealthiest Jews in Poland and also the first Jew in Poland to own land at that time. Um, and he gained all of his wealth from um, supplying the Polish and Russian armies with all of their goods. So with like horses, leather, grains, cloths, you named it, the, he supplied it. Um, and fun fact, it was said that from the years of 1792 to 1794, 
the government owed him about 80,000 rubles, which was, I did the math for us. That was about 30, that was actually a little over $30,000 at that time. Um, and it was said that um, all of his descendants would own, would come to own about 20% of the, all of the banks in central Poland. So they were, they were very comfortable. Um, so this Tumoral story and the family story all took place around when Hasidism was really catching on. Uh, so Beric's father, Shmuel, was a, was a follower of Hasidish, the Hasidism movement. Um, he really enjoyed it. And his son, Beric, also really enjoyed it. And, and um, so Temeral was really the one who pushed um, for them to start not only just following Hasidism, but also they wanted to start financing uh, for a shul. They financed for the first shul to come into Warsaw, Poland, the first Hasidic shul. Um, and they also financed for a Beit Midrash and eventually they bought books for them. And they also helped to uh, finance all of the Talmidei Chachamim that would come through there, like the Rebbe's and every, and um, just like, so they do so much chesed and give so much tzedakah to help people in need. Um, so unfortunately in 1822, Tamaral's husband passed away, leaving six kids and all of his business uh, assets. So before he died, he had said that he was very confident that Tamaral would take care of all of all of his debts, all of his business dealings. Um, he would that she would continue to take care of the community, and she continued to do that. She she provided for all of the poor people. She continued to supply for all of the tzaddikim, the talmidei chachamim, the shuls, the beit midrash. And uh, she even eventually opened up her own bank, which between 1830 and 1837 circulated over $30 million. Um, and that was just her doing. So she, she definitely made her own name for herself in business. Um, and that led to great influence in the secular world as well as the Jewish world. Um, so during that time in Poland, there was a rule that that Jews weren't able to own real estate, um, specifically in certain areas. And so her husband, years prior, tried uh, purchasing real estate, thinking that he was um, also influential in the community. Um, but the, the government wouldn't allow him to because he refused to cut off his payout and his beard. Temeral, however, was able to, even though her husband wasn't. Um, so she she was the third person at that time who was able to buy real estate in that area. And um, there were only 60 other Jews, or, you know, she was one of the 60 Jews to be able to do that. Um, so so yeah, she was she was definitely seen as an influential figure in so many different circles and that really helped her and it helped her to help the Jews out as well. This is a hard time over there. Um, so there are so many different really interesting stories about her and all of the all of the uh, tzedakah she gave and all the kindness that she did. So one of them is that she she had a Torah written for a tzaddik, five all of Grzeck, and um, and he used that money that she donated, the proceeds. He used the proceeds to marry to help marry off several female orphans. Um, so that was kind of in her zechut. And another story was Rav Simcha Bunim uh, went to Warsaw. He was a, he was used to living a slightly more comfortable lifestyle, so he went to more of a classy hotel 
Um, and unfortunately, his money ended up running out. So he dove in, he wasn't sure what to do. And Tumrel kind of happened into his life and offered him um, to become an agent for her liquor distillery. Um, and so he agreed. He eventually, he did bookkeeping for him, for her. He eventually became a Hasidic rav in the community. Um, and so he made it. So in the mornings, he would set a couple, a few hours a day to, to deal with her business and help her out. And then dedicate that the rest of the time to just learn Torah, help out the community. Um, and she said that all of her profits are from are uh, from all of this Torah learning. And so she continued to use the, those extra profits to continue giving back to the community. Um, so she was, so as we can see, she was just a very respected and honored woman in the community. Um, there are a couple of sources say that pe people actually referred to her as Reb sometimes. Like she was so honored in the Hasidic community specifically that they would refer to her as Reb. Um, and on her tombstone, they wrote to her nation, she was a protector against oppression a helper during distress, to the poor she was a mother, she was a virtuous woman, powerful and famous. So that was just the slightest bit into her life. She was a really amazing, amazing woman and uh, the, the amount she accomplished given her time period and her, um, and just everything around her was incredible. Um, yeah, if anyone would like to learn more about her family, her in-laws, her, Husband's family was also very interesting and helpful um, in the Jewish community as well. But yeah, that's all I have. Okay. That's really, that's really amazing. It's one woman without her entire Hasidic communities would not exist. It's really amazing what one person can do. It's very fitting that Zavi is the one who's you know presenting on this person. Um. So the person I'm presenting on, um, this is a, a woman who's current, uh, still living. She's living currently in the UK. Her name is Miss Shani Lisser, um, and her main name uh, was Sipper. Um, so I'll, I'll share a little bit about her background, and then we'll, we'll get to her uh, unique and very very special uh, initiatives that she's that she's done, um, and credit goes well. Credit goes to everyone who arranged this. Thank you, Rabbi Rosenberg. But I, I got this from a a book by Rabbi Y. Y. Rubinstein, um, who I believe is also from the UK, maybe originally from Ireland. So he, he wrote a, a book called um, "Like Great Women Then and Now," I believe. Okay, so uh, Shani's parents were, were both originally from Germany. Um, her father made it into the UK and won the kinder transport. So unfortunately he was separated from his family, but he survived. Um, and her mother's family miraculously was able to come as a, as a whole family, like to escape Germany to the UK. Um, she was one of five children. Um, she grew up in Stamford Hill, located in London. Um, growing up, she first attended a uh, Lubavitch school, um, which was in the local area. And then after that, for seminary, she went to um, the Gateshead Seminary of, um, ran by Rev Dessler. Um, for, for, the, for like a, about five years, her, like she and her husband weren't able to have children. So when they had their first child, they wanted to find like a, a special way to have some hakar satov to show gratitude to God. Um, and they decided that they wanted to adopt the child to show their gratitude. Um, but they, they soon discovered it, it wasn't so simple to adopt the Jewish child. The, there was more people that wanted to adopt them than the amount of children um, were available for adoption. Um, so they, they put that idea on hold and they, they continued to grow their family. Um, as, as an aside, um, it mentions in the book 
that when she was 11 or 12 years old, when one of her teachers asked the class like what each child wanted to do when they grew up, the, most of the children probably gave like the typical answers. I wanna be a chef, I wanna be a lawyer, I wanna be a doctor. Um, Ms. Shani Lister says like, she doesn't know what caused her to answer this, but she said, I wanna start an orphanage. She said that that's what she wanted to do when she grew up. Um, so keep that in the back burner. Um, she and she had no one in her family like she wasn't adopted she didn't have anyone else in her family who was involved in adoption but her father did do a lot of chesed and actually was like played a big role in one of the first um kirov initiatives in uh in the uk um what one of the the first outreach programs um a, a few years passed um and they they uh, an opportunity knocked on their door to adopt not a newborn baby, but to adopt an 18 year old um, boy who at the time it, it wasn't presented as, as an adoption. He just was going to stay over Hog over the holidays. Basically, he he ran away from his family. Um, he, he had a, a very troubled past and he, he was looking for a welcoming home. And they, of course, accepted him for Chag. Um, he wound up staying with them for two years. Um, they, they went on to find him a, a match, a shidduch, and they were the, the grandparents for his children as well. Um, as time went on, they, they became known, like they, they would accept more and more cases like this where there would be children who, um, for whatever reason, either their parents could no longer have them or, or they ran away because they didn't feel comfortable at home. Um, and then they would arrive at the, the Lisser's doorstep. Um, and when, the, when Moshe Lisser was interviewed about this, Shani's husband, so he was, um, he, he was a caterer in, in what apparently is a very large catering business in London. And he said as much as he like backs what his wife was doing, all the credit goes to her because he, he said like he was very much consumed by his business and, and she was taking charge of this. Um, so the, the, the story goes that she like took on many of these children, but like her own, um, and the, the, there was one story that, um, she had like, um, the, this teenager by her, um, and it, it turned out that the teenager was 15 at night when, when everyone would go to sleep, he would take the car. Um, and the way this was discovered, because some tickets showed up in the mail. And uh, Miss Lister didn't show any anger, but, but she turned to him and she said, listen, there has to be a consequence. I need you to give me your phone for a day. Um, and, and this teenager be began to get like very angry. And, and he had a history of, of being abused, being like uh, physically abused and beaten. And he also had a history of fighting back. Um, and there was someone in the house downstairs listening to this exchange of Miss Lister asking for the phone. And he, he was nervous that, that, that this boy was gonna go and attack her, but she didn't flinch. And eventually like he, he let his anger down and he gave her the phone. And when this person was talking to Miss Lister afterwards, she said, I knew there was no way he was gonna attack me because, like, because we're family. Um, then uh, eventually, um, Ms. Ryan Lister realized that um, she could like be doing more with her efforts. So, and she was also getting uh, a bit older. So she stopped accepting um, children. And what, what she did instead is she started an organization to try to, 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 try to cure the, this problem before it becomes a problem, basically. Um, she, her, her phone is always on and available for parents who are having um, a, a difficult time with, with children who are, um, for, for whatever reason, the, the, they're, uh, the, they're having a hard time at home, that they, they reach out to her. Uh, and Rabbi Y.Y. Rubenstein said he had an interview set up with Miss Lister, and she only agreed to it, not, like she said that she did not want it to be about her at all. She wanted it to be about her organization. So she started this organization where she counts as parents. It is called um, Unconditional Parenting. There it is, uh, Unconditional Parenting. Um, she and she hired a, a rabbi who 
deals directly with the children and also kind of like paves way, the way with their schools. But Miss Lisser's main role is counseling. Uh, and, and she's really being mechanich and teaching many parents like um, how to give this unconditional love, unconditional parent, parenting to their children. Um, and uh, I believe she still does this to this day. Um, so I'm doing Rebbitz and Esther Young Race, which um, I was originally going to do um, Ramosha. I was thinking about it. Like we know a lot about um, the Rebbe's wife, like Chaya Mershka, but I was like, oh, let me do Ramosha Feinstein's wife. And we really couldn't, like I even asked Rabbi Rosenberg to help me. <laughs> he said he only could find like a paragraph about her, which is, we, we still have still much to do with this, um, which I'm grateful that we talk about different women. But yeah, this is, um, so I just chose to do another woman. but. Um, Rebecca Nestor Young Rice is a phenomenal person. She spoke to me at Casino Night in, in Torah High. And ever since then, I've just been amazed by her and, and how she looked and how she presented herself. Um, really was like an angel uh, personality. But um, Esther Young Rice was born in Szeged, Szeged, Hungary, on April 26th, 7th, 1936, Avram and Miriam Young Rice. Um, she descended from a great rabbinic dynasty that traced its lineage back to King David, which is really pretty awesome. Um, it's even crazier. She survived the Holocaust. She was in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camps, um, which is really, I, I think Hungary was like the last to be taken by the Nazis. So I think she was like about what, like 10 years old, 11. Um, and she wasn't there for so long. Thank God, like maybe half a year. Um, but during the camp, um, it was, she was just like explaining every, like how she um, interacted, it was, it was insane. During the camp, there was one moment when the, um, the Nazi guard called her a Jewish pig. And she, she thought to herself, these are the gentlemen, like everyone calls Nazis the gentlemen and cultural and they're the master race. She said, Baruch Hashem, that I am not the daughter of your people, that I am the daughter of my father and my mother, the daughter of a nation that stood at Sinai and heard the voice of Hashem. Uh, and we live by the covenant that he gave us and not the daughter of a nation of brutes and murderers. So even then, she's like 10, 11 years old, and she has this, um, this pride that she, like, she's a part of the Jewish people. Um, what I remember the story she gave to us when she visited San Diego it, when I was in high school, she said that like her parents were just amazing, phenomenal people. Thank God her, her father and her mother survived the war as well. Um, she said the like Shabbos in the camps were, were really like pretty insane. Her father would save every single day. He'd save a few crumbs um, and he would collect them. So on Shabbos, the, they were exhausted and tired and cold and he'd wake them up in the middle of the night and he'd say children like come it's Shabbos dinner like we're gonna we're having challah mommy made challah for you and the children would get so excited and she remembers that excitement and that love that her father gave that even like he was starving himself but he saved a few scraps for her and that's what she kept with her that love and like um like even through the darkest times, you can still have beauty and um, mysterious nefesh. Um, so after the war uh, in 1947, the family moved to Brooklyn, New York. Um, there were a lot of times that she learned to be, she was a great speaker, first of all. Um, she would, she um, would help a lot of non-religious Jewish people come back to Judaism, but her, how she built that that foundation it was her father uh would have her invite the non-religious Jewish kids on her block for Shabbos and she was nervous because she didn't speak English she was from Hungary um and she would they just moved in but he said you know go invite the kids and she didn't want to but she said she her love of her father um and her respect you know from seeing him in the camps and everything she she did it even though she was so young and nervous um, and she invited them to come and they all came. And that's when they learned that like the young Rice's house was a place to be for Judaism and a warmth. Um, and she married her distant cousin, Rabbi Young Rice. Um, so she didn't have to switch her name, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, 
and they settled in North Woodmere and founded the Congregation Ortora. And they raised four children. Um, Ortora still stands today. People have their shoals there, the shoals still there. They have weddings there. They have everything there still, which I thought that was an interesting thing. Her husband, um, they're talking about also the the energy they had to do deal with to get back to then North Woodmere, the five towns, they didn't have any Jewish um, religious Jews. And the rabbi, her husband would knock on doors every every day, every Shabbos. He'd say like, hey, come to Minion, like I think Minion Club, he called it, where they'd have like some orange juice and maybe some candies for them to come so they'd get a Minion. So I felt like that was pretty relevant. Um, she created Hineni, which is why she's so, um, besides for what she already did before, but um, why she's so respected and famous and well-known right now. Um, Hineni is an organization that helps people who are not religious. She she gives them like uh, spiritual growth and, and uh, lectures and you can go to her. She You could have gone to her and, and just talked to her about your problems. She did this because she saw the physical, she saw the physical Jewish Holocaust, but then also realized there was going to be a spiritual Holocaust at the end, like when she came to America. And so she founded Hineni to help um, the religion, the non-religious go back to their roots. Um, and then also from like that Shabbos um, story that she, um, she, even though she saw the worst in people, she was able to see the greatness in people. Like even when her father was, at the worst level and feel like feeling that there was Gehenna around him he still saved those scraps and he wanted to create that feeling of warmth and Judaism and his children and Shabbos the specialness of Shabbos so that was like that was really amazing um she gave advice so one of the stories that I that I read that really um I took to heart was she said uh Someone came to her and said, oh, Rabbitson, I'm ashamed to burden you with my silly problems. I know that there are people who are much worse off than I am. The, so uh, Rabbitson Young Rice said, don't be too hard on yourself. Knowing that someone else has more trouble than you does not minimize your own pain. She said she never quite got like the, the saying that says, um, I complained that I had no shoes until I saw a man with no feet. She said that, um, what comfort can a decent person derived from knowing that someone is worse off than he or she is to be sure you feel the pain for the man uh who has no feet but that doesn't put shoes on their own feet um yeah sorry the problem still uh the problem still remains like even if you understand what like someone else is in a worse place you're still gonna have that problem um and it even hurts knowing you feel guilty uh, when you feel guilty that so you're upset about something, which even makes it even the pain worse. Um, I always related to that because, you know, um, people would say like, oh, you know, don't, don't, you, you, like someone else is in a worse situation, but you, everybody has challenges at their own, on their own level, based on their own time. So I related to that. Um, she said that uh, Halloween came to where they lived. In the, uh, it was Shabbos on it, the year that year it was Shabbos during Halloween um, and kids came to her door and they rang the doorbell and it was Friday night and you and all, everybody all the guests at her Shabbos table were like don't answer the door it's trick-or-treaters uh, she said no let's answer it you know like it might be Jewish children at, at that door we we can you know we could always have a chance to help them out so she answered the door um, and she said, are you Jewish? And all the kids mostly said yes. So she gave them a candy and she taught them, hey, you know, you can say a bracha, a blessing on this candy. And she taught them the bracha and she said, hey, well, tell your tell your parents that I gave you candy and that there's a Hebrew school. And actually one of the kids uh, told their parents and they sent him to Hebrew school. And he's actually religious today. He came back and told her like what an impact it made on him. Um, and then also she told them about like how there's a better holiday on Purim and they should all come and the festivities. So that was pretty remarkable. She spoke to thousands of people in Madison Square Garden. Um, it's yeah, it's and her kids um, deal with Hineni even now. It's in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. 
Um, I could go on and on about her. She was just a wonderful, remarkable woman. Um, her, she wrote four books, which are remarkable books. I, it, I read them all the time. Um, she passed away in 2016, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I've got to say.